Lecture 16, The Reader's Writer's Problem. So this is the second of the classical synchronization problems that we have uh, decided we will give the most attention to in this course. Uh, and it is a slightly interesting version that's uh, not that common because um, people don't always sort of think to use it. Uh, but it depends heavily on the nature of your data as to whether it's even an option. So the key observation about the reader's writer's problem is that, well, reading data doesn't interfere with another read of the data. You can't have two writes at the same time. You can't have a write and a read at the same time. Um, you, you can't have you know, any number of writes but concurrent with anything else, but reads don't interfere with reads. So sometimes it would be advantageous to then allow different reads to happen concurrently. Um, but sometimes writes occur and nobody can read when that happens. So this does allow for some amount of concurrency. So I mean, as the uh, image illustrates, right, we could have lots of people reading from the book concurrently. This might seem kind of silly. Um, you might think, when would you ever want this? But there's lots of scenarios where this is the case, where reading data is much more common than writing data. Um, anytime data is being published uh, to news website, for example, a blog, anything like that, um, reading is tremendously more common than writing. Um, and yet you wouldn't want people to load the page and see it in an incomplete state. So you would want to delay those reads until the newest version has been published. Uh, and that, you know, the newest version might be published very quickly, but not instantly. So there's a quick example of a scenario where you might want to uh, have you know, some concurrent reads. Obviously, you, know, you don't want to read a web page one at a time. Uh, but also when it's writing, you don't want anybody to be able to read that uh, incomplete version of the page. So if you want, there are two rules and only two rules. Number one, any number of readers may be in the critical section simultaneously. And number two, only one writer can be in the critical section. And when it is in the critical section, there are also no readers. Uh, and this is also something that's frequently uh, implemented in file systems. You can have a file that's open to read only by a large number of files, but only one file can open it for writing. Uh, and obviously to prevent reading of inconsistent data, it can't be open for reading while the write is going on. Now maybe you think this is just something that's very similar to the general mutual exclusion type problems that we've talked about before. Um, thing is, there's a key distinction in that we have two kinds of thread in this scenario. Um, we have readers that don't modify any data. So consumers in the producer-consumer problem count as modifying data because they take data out of the buffer. That is a modification uh, and that counts. Um, and so if a thread could read or write a shared data structure, it is a writer. Uh, and if you have only writers, or at least any thread is potentially a writer, then you end up just with the regular mutual exclusion kind of solutions that we have talked about previously. Uh, and you don't uh, need or want the reader's writer's problem because it doesn't give you anything extra. However, if you do have some threads that are readers, then allowing multiple readers can permit uh, multiple uh, readers to complete in the same amount of time. They don't have to wait for each other. So it does give you better performance. That would actually be interesting. Now, your uh, actual application's nature determines whether or not it's worth your while to do this. Right, you have to know how many readers are there versus how many writers and how much time do readers potentially spend waiting. Uh, and you know, this gives you some basis on which to calculate if it's worth your while. Um, but for the moment, um, we'll assume that there are valid scenarios and you want to learn about this so you have it in your toolkit. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you don't know about it, you can't use it. So we'll uh, at least uh, introduce it and you can decide later if it's applicable to the particular problem that you want to look at. So let's get started. We need to keep track of the number of readers at any given time using uh, a counter readers. Uh, and we 
will of course uh, have this updated by different threads so we need a way of protecting this variable from concurrent modification so we'll have a semaphore mutex that we're going to use to protect that or just a mutex type we also need another further semaphore room empty uh, and room empty is going to be our way of indicating, of course, that the room is empty. Uh, the room, in this case, is our critical section. Uh, and a writer has to wait for the room to be empty, that is, wait on the room empty semaphore, before it's allowed to enter the room. Again, the room is the critical section here. Okay, so I mean, why is the semaphore called room empty? Thing is that um, we will sometimes encounter a naming convention of some sort that is, um, uh, it, it makes sense from a certain perspective and might seem strange from another perspective, um, but the goal of something like wanting to wait for room empty is that uh, it, when we say that out loud, when we think about it in you know, normal language, like English, uh, that it gives us a clear indication of what is the condition that we're waiting for. So if we're a writer and we want to wait for there to be no threads in the critical section, you could say wait for room empty, and that has you know, a, uh, I won't say you know, unambiguous meaning, but it has a straightforward meaning uh, that you can understand what is uh, the condition that we're waiting for. We're waiting for all threads to have exited the critical section. Okay, so let's look at solution one. We have on the left the writer, very simple, uh, and on the right we have a reader, somewhat more complicated, as you can see. So we'll, uh, we'll start with the writer, just because it is the much simpler version. So if a writer shows up, the writer can only enter into the critical section if the room is empty, so it waits for the room is em to be empty, uh, and it then can enter, write some data, and then post on room empty, indicating the writer has left, and the room is empty once again. Okay, that part's um, straightforward. If we had a second writer or something and the room was not empty, it would wait, and you know, another writer uh, could, uh, could then appear. Well, this, this thing is, you know, straightforward. The reader is more complicated. It resembles to some extent the rendezvous and barrier things that we've discussed before, but it is somewhat different, so we shouldn't get them confused. Now, the reader waits on the mutex, increments the number of readers, uh, and if readers is one, uh, wait for room empty. Okay, uh, if we're not the first reader, then we'll skip over that. Uh, post on the mutex, read some data. Uh, when we're done reading, wait. Uh, again, on the mutex, decrement the number of readers. Uh, if readers is now zero, we'll post on room empty, uh, indicating that the room is empty, and then we will uh, exit here from uh, from the critical section here with post mutex. Okay, this is a little bit of what I mean uh, for you know, the the convention being, you know, how do you um, talk about it in natural language, indicating what you should name your semaphores. Okay. So if we are the first reader, um, we get to the uh, we get to the statement uh, on line four that says wait for room to be empty. Um, if the room is currently empty, we proceed immediately, but we have to some extent locked the room, which would prevent a writer from entering. Uh, and that's what we want because we are a reader uh, and we are going to enter the room uh, and we will proceed. If we are not the first, then we just skip over that and we proceed, you know, we've incremented the count of readers and we proceed immediately to reading some data. All is well. So that part is, uh, is mirrored a little bit in the uh, second half where after we've read some data, we decrement readers. If we're not the last one, then we just you know, decrement and leave. If we are the last one, then we post on room empty, which potentially unblocks a writer if one of them was waiting. Okay. Yeah, um, so the first reader locks the room, so to speak, pre prevents a writer from entering. Additional readers don't have to check if the room is empty. They can just proceed because if there are, multi if, if there are you know, readers present, then you know, we know they're in the room, uh, in which case there's no writers and we don't have to worry about whether or not the room is empty, so it's no big deal. We can just proceed. When the last one leaves the room, it indicates the room is empty. Okay, this pattern is sometimes referred to as a light switch. 
bad jokes aside, why a light switch? Well, the behavior that we're thinking about is kind of like, you know, what happens when you go into a room. If you're the first one into the room, you know, there's nobody there, then you turn on the lights. Uh, and when you're the last to leave a room, you turn the lights off. You know, that's only polite and doesn't waste energy, so, you know, that is wise. Uh, and that's the behavior that we're seeing with the reader's behavior. You can think of the reader's behavior here at statement four when it does wait on room empty as turning on the lights because, well, if you want to read, you could use some light. That would be helpful. Uh, and when the last reader is leaving here at the end, we will post on room empty, turning off the light. Uh, and the same is true for the writer. The writer waits for the room to be empty. That is, in a wait for the light to be turned off. Uh, then... You know, if it's uh, if it is already off, the writer turns it on, uh, and then when the writer leaves the room, turns it off as well. Okay, so um, the reader code has one of those situations that makes us concerned. Yeah, uh, it has wait on room empty inside a critical section controlled by mutex. Uh, as you will remember from the previous topic when we talked about these nested weights, that is a cause for concern, but it isn't a guarantee that something is wrong. You can convince yourself that there is no deadlock, and as before, the solution that I propose for how you want to address that is the work backwards thing, which is what would cause a reader to get blocked on the inner wait, uh, that is, wait for room to be empty. Well, the only scenario in which that could happen is if we are the first reader, uh, and you know, therefore we call wait there. If we were not the first reader, we wouldn't call wait at all, so no cause for concern, but we are the first reader, and the only way that if we are the first reader that the room is not empty is that means there is a writer in the room or in the critical section, right? So that is the only way that a reader thread could get blocked here at wait for room empty. A writer, uh, once it's entered the room, is in the section write data and it will always get to the post statement here. Uh, and this will take a finite amount of time. You know, exactly how long depends on how much data we're writing. Um, but it is a finite amount of time and therefore uh, we'll get to the post statement that will unblock the reader and we won't have any sort of deadlock. You can also ask, is it possible for writers to get stuck? Well, if a writer is uh, is blocked here at the wait room empty statement, the, you know, again, there's one of two ways that it could be waiting. One is it's waiting for another writer. If it's waiting for another writer, then it can enter here uh, and, uh, and leave after that writer has finished. Again, it takes a finite amount of time. Uh, and if it's waiting for readers, then when the last reader leaves the room, it calls post on room empty and allows the writer to continue. So the writer won't get stuck. So there won't be a deadlock. However, there is another kind of problem. It's not a deadlock, but it is similar that we need to be concerned about. Uh, and suppose that some readers are in the room and a writer arrives. The writer will wait until all the readers have left the room, and of course, when each of the readers is finished, it exits as it should. In the meantime, while you know, those reads were taking place, more readers arrive and enter the room. Even though each reader is in the room for only a finite amount of time, it could occur that there is never a moment when the room has no readers in it. Uh, that is, you know, if every read takes five seconds or something like that, you, know, you could have a reader arrive, and after three seconds, the next reader arrives, uh, and then five seconds after that, the next one arrives, and there's always just like a little bit of overlap between readers. Every reader finishes in five seconds, uh, but there is never a gap where there are no readers. That's an undesirable situation, because, of course, the writer never gets a chance under this scenario. The reader threads are not stuck. They all read, and they continue, and they leave. No problem. And the writer thread you know, is, is you know, unable to proceed ever, but it's not really deadlocked either. So we have a different term for this, and the term for that is starvation. And starvation is basically what happens when a thread never gets a chance to run. Uh, that is to say that the system is sufficiently unfair that a thread doesn't ever do its job. 
as you will recall, we had a number of uh, criteria that we wanted for a desirable mutual exclusion situation, uh, and uh, it, that means it must not be possible for a thread to be delayed indefinitely. And uh, so previously I said, well, that means just no deadlock because you know, it means they don't all get stuck. Um, but now we know, actually, that that's not the only thing we should worry about. Uh, this problem is just as bad as deadlock. You could uh, say that if a uh, starvation scenario is possible uh, in your program, it means that this solution is not okay and we can't use it. We have to uh, go back to our uh, design and come up with a better one, a better design, that does not uh, have the possibility of starvation, even though starvation might be unlikely. So what we're going to need to do is improve our solution such that writers can no longer starve. Uh, and just thinking about it conceptually, you know, how would you want to do this? How would you make sure that writers don't starve? Okay, it may have uh, occurred to you that uh, you know, fundamentally starvation is unfair uh, in that a uh, writer thread arrives at uh, 4 o'clock, let's say, uh, and other threads that arrive after it get to go ahead of it in line. Now maybe that gives you an indication of the concept that we would like to to solve here, which is that we could reduce this problem by, you know, being more fair in that readers that arrive after the writer should have to wait and let the writer have a turn. So that's our conceptual approach to the solution. When a writer arrives, any readers that are currently you know, in their critical section are permitted to finish their read. It, it would not be productive to, you know, cancel them or... <laughs> Uh, restart them or anything like that. You wouldn't want that. Uh, and the second part of that is that no new readers should be allowed to start reading. So anybody who's currently in progress is allowed to finish. Anybody who has not yet started will have to wait until uh, the writer has had a chance. And so now the number of readers that is allowed to enter this section is finite. It's however many were there when the writer showed up. So if there were 10 readers in the section at the time, those 10 can continue. If it was one, uh, then it's one. If it was zero, then the writer gets a turn immediately, doesn't have to wait for uh, any of the uh, readers to finish. Uh, but if there are some, we wait for them to finish. Very good. The writer does eventually get a turn because the readers do take a finite amount of time uh, and then the writer can proceed. When the writer is done, then readers that were waiting are allowed to enter and they can now read the updated value. Okay, so to make that work, um, we've had to add an additional semaphore here and it's called turn style. Uh, and we're going to uh, combine effectively our, uh, our barrier a little bit with our reader's writer's solution. So we'll start again with the writer code because it is simpler. Uh, when the writer shows up, the first thing it does is lock the turn style by calling wait turn style. Uh, and that means that any readers that arrive after that happens will have to wait at that point until the writer has had a chance to go through. Then the writer, as per usual, waits for the room to be empty, so all of the current readers uh, are allowed to finish their execution. Makes sense. Uh, that's one of the uh, goals that we discussed already. Uh, and then we're going to write data, then post on turnstile, so unlock the turnstile, and then post on room empty. Uh, you might wonder about, does it make sense to post on turnstile first or post on room empty after? Um, in general, it's not usually a problem uh, when you are calling post, the order in which those statements occur. Uh, it's only really a problem uh, about locking because you can get a deadlock if your lock order is, is wrong. Uh, but for the most part, uh, it is less important what order you post in. As for the reader, the reader code didn't change very much. All we did was add at the beginning the wait and post turnstile statements. 
So under normal circumstances, uh, when turnstile will be initialized to one, uh, a reader that shows up will be allowed to proceed immediately, and it will decrement turnstile and then immediately increment it again, thus allowing the next reader to proceed. The only scenario that's different is if a writer has locked the turnstile, then readers get blocked at the turnstile uh, before they are allowed to proceed. So not much change there. Now, when the writer um, posts on turnstile, incidentally, it could, of course, unlock the turnstile, thus unblocking a reader or another writer. It doesn't matter very much uh, which one that is. Uh, you could get either one, depending on who is waiting. Uh, and if I hadn't made it clear previously, uh, it, it is important to remember that um, when a thread gets unblocked after waiting on a semaphore or mutex or whatever, the order in which uh, those threads are unblocked is decided by the operating system. It is not up to you. It's not necessarily first come, first served or anything like that. So in principle, uh, you could have a writer that gets unblocked, even though some readers arrived in between when the first writer arrived and when the second one did. This just happens. Okay, so does this solution satisfy our goals uh, in that we no longer have starvation, but also we didn't introduce deadlock? Okay, um, so starvation really had only one scenario that uh, we were concerned about, and we found a way to address it. Writers and readers will eventually get a turn, uh, and that's addressed, uh, and we should uh, be easily able to convince ourselves that that is not the case. Um, and uh, as for deadlock, um, we already covered uh, deadlock, the addition of the... Uh, addition of the uh, turnstile for the reader didn't change the calculus here. The only thing that's new to assess uh, that we might be concerned about is weight uh, on turnstile followed by weight on room empty. Uh, once again, we'll go through the logic of that of, well, the only way we get blocked on room empty is if either some readers are in the room or another writer is in the room. Whichever one of those it is, we will eventually get unblocked. So that didn't change too much. Uh, versus what we had before, but the nested weights should give you a little bit of concern and you should, you know, think about it. So, yeah, uh, as long as we can reason that this is not a problem, then we can say, yes, the solution is acceptable. Now, one of the things that's noteworthy about this is that while it prevents writers from starving, it doesn't give writers priority. You might actually want that. When a writer exits from the uh, critical section, it posts on turnstile and it unblocks some other thread, whether that is a reader or writer, depends. Uh, if it unblocks a reader, it is possible, of course, that a whole bunch of readers will enter before the next writer is unblocked uh, and the turnstile is, is locked again. Um, that may or may not be desirable, depending on your application. Sometimes you really do want to make sure that readers are always getting the most up-to-date information, in which case you don't want to allow uh, a writer to wait. For some applications, it doesn't matter. Uh, for some purposes, it doesn't matter very much. If you are uh, you know, publishing uh, some blog post or something, you know, does it matter if people see the version that's two minutes out of date? Maybe not. Um, depends on the article. You know, if it's about... Uh, some important live breaking news event, then yeah, maybe the up to date information is valuable. But if it's just, oh, well, we have to uh, update a spelling mistake in our review of this terrible movie, then uh, not, not critical. Don't, uh, don't sweat it. Now, uh, if there is a need to give writers priority, there are some strategies for doing so. In previous courses, actually, we didn't go into it, but you know, we uh, have time now. Uh, and yeah, uh, what you actually end up with is uh, something along these lines where uh, there are you know, two categories. You know, there, there are the uh, peasants in economy class and then there are the lordly folk uh, in priority boarding. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, basically, we are saying that uh, the writers are the business class of this airplane, uh, and the readers are economy class. Everybody gets there in the end, but priority boarding means that writers get to be on the plane first because yes definitely when i am flying for several hours i want to spend more time on the plane okay uh, actually um, priority boarding is valuable in an era where uh, airlines charge you for check bags or you know for uh, overhead uh, bags that don't fit uh because well overhead bin space is limited uh, and you want to get it so uh, yeah, you you played yourselves airlines Okay, so we actually want to modify our solution so that writers have priorities over readers. In this case, we will stick with just two categories. There's writers and there's readers. So uh, we, uh, an actual um, Air Canada flight has several boarding zones. You know, there's zone one for business class and zone two for premium economy. Uh, yeah, okay, we're not taking it that far. Um, we are just taking it to there are still two. Now, we probably actually want to break up the room empty semaphore into two things. So uh, we are no longer saying just whether the room is empty. We, we want to know, are there any readers or writers? So we need a no readers and no writers semaphore. Uh, a reader in the critical section should hold the no readers semaphore, and a writer should hold no writers as well as no readers. Just a little hint. Uh, as to designing the solution. If you wanted to pause it and sort of try to think it out, um, then by all means, but we'll just proceed. Okay, uh, our solution has become a lot more symmetrical as compared to previously. Previously, the uh, writer code was a lot shorter and a lot simpler as compared to the reader code, but now they are close to the same, uh, and they are, to some extent, a mirror image of one another. Uh, just it, because we've done it thus far, we'll start with the uh, writer code, because the, the reader code actually hasn't changed very much. Um, but the writer code waits on a write mutex, increments a count of the number of writers. Write mutex will obviously be initialized to 1, and writers as an integer will be uh, incremented to 0. If we are the first writer, then we have to wait for there to be no readers. That's uh, not too different from what we saw before. That is, we need to wait for all of the readers to leave the room before we are allowed to proceed. Uh, and at that point, any subsequent writers will be blocked uh, at statement one, that is, uh, waiting, for, uh, waiting for the right mutex. So that's fine. Uh, and uh, when we are able to continue, then we wait uh, for no writers. So we're... Uh, locking that, if you will. Uh, we will write some data and then we will post on no writers. Uh, and that part just prevents, uh, the steps seven and nine part, prevents uh, more than one writer from writing data at the same time. That still wouldn't be okay. Uh, writers do have to have exclusive access to the data to write it correctly, otherwise you know, we don't get the correct behavior. Um, but that's straightforward. Uh, and then we will uh, decrement the count of writers inside the write mutex. If writers are zero, we will post on no readers. Uh, and uh, if we are uh, not the last writer, we post on write mutex. Uh, and this part here uh, in the lower part of the writer code is actually how we ensure that writers get priority. Because if we are not the last writer, uh, then when we post on write mutex and, and what have you, like when we've left from here, uh, the next writer, if there is one, will be the one that proceeds immediately. Right? Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't give readers an opportunity to advance. They're all stuck uh, at, their, uh, at their first statement uh, because there is another writer. Uh, and so only if we are the last writer and there are no other writers waiting do we say, yes, readers are allowed to have a chance. And that's the magic in it. That's the trick. That's how we make sure that writers uh, are always uh, taking priority. If any of them are waiting, then readers don't get to go. The reader code is, again, not too different from before. It's been split up a little bit because we have now you know, different semaphores. Uh, but the reader waits on no readers. Uh, and uh, that means that if uh, a writer is uh, holding on to that, then, well, readers can't proceed. Uh, and that's where readers would get stuck.
Now we've um, hit on one of those scenarios where we had to choose a name convention that makes sense from the perspective of one kind of thread, but less sense from the perspective of another. Um, it makes sense for a writer to wait for there to be no readers, uh, but it makes less sense for a reader to wait for there to be no readers. Uh, that doesn't like, flow as nicely in sort of common language. Uh, but you could name the semaphores whatever you want. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't affect the correctness of the solution. Uh, it maybe just would be more in line with how you think about it. That would be okay, as long as you you know use the correct semaphores and use them correctly. Uh, it's not that important uh, what their exact names are. So. Uh, if we are a reader uh, and we wait on no readers and we don't get blocked, uh, then it means that there are no writers at present. If we do get blocked, there are writers and we'll have to wait until we're done, uh, until they're done. Then we wait on read mutex, increment the number of readers. If we are the first reader, then wait on no writers, which will prevent writers from proceeding because there are now, uh, no, there are now readers in the room. Okay, only one, but there is a reader in the room. Uh, post on read mutex uh, and uh, post on no readers, which will then uh, allow the next reader uh, who, was, uh, who was waiting to enter, if there is one. Um, th it, it could be, of course, that, that uh, this post on no readers actually unblocks a writer, and the writer will say, stop, no further readers are allowed to continue. That could happen as well. Uh, but we'll read some data. Uh, we will wait on the read mutex, decrement number of readers. If we are the last reader, then we can say, yep, we're done. Writers are allowed to proceed. Uh, and there we go. Yeah, uh, the complexity increased quite a lot. Um, the reader is you know, not all that different from how it was before, and the writer is to some extent you know, this, this mirror image. Uh, but this is complicated. And uh, you'll see it doesn't get that much better when we actually go over to the, uh, to the code example. So, yeah, using the pseudocode that we have, um, we can, of course, turn that into the reader's writer's behavior in a given program using only the semaphore uh, and optionally a mutex that we have already learned about. That's great. However, don't reinvent the wheel. In the pthread library, there are supports for the lock types of mutex uh, and semaphore, but also reader writers ones. Uh, and so we should use the specialized type because it will save you a tremendous amount of typing. And you'll see that when we get to uh, actually looking at the code, you can see what the old way looks like versus the new way. So to get there, though, I will uh, first introduce the syntax for the readers, writers, lock types, and everything that we need to know about how to uh, how to use it. So uh, there are initialization and destroy functions. So um, for our, for a given pthread read write lock type, uh, we initialize it with the init function. Takes a pointer to the lock you want to initialize and a pointer to the attributes. Attributes will be null, defaults are fine. Uh, and RW lock is obviously the one we want to initialize. Destroy is just like a regular mutex. Uh, P thread RW lock destroy takes a pointer to the thing you want to destroy. There's no real difference. The only thing that's different is the type. Very good. Uh, and then for locking, there are four lock functions. There's read lock, try read lock, write lock, try write lock. We can acquire either a read lock or write lock. I think those are self-explanatory. If you are only going to read, then you can acquire a read lock. If you are going to read and write, then you acquire a write lock. Uh, and for each of those, there is an associated try lock function. As with the regular mutex, we are not quite prepared to talk about try lock. Um, so just file this away for later that we will return to the subject of try lock. And uh, you know, this is a valid option. All four functions take exactly one argument. Uh, it is the lock that you intend to lock. No, uh, no surprise there. In theory, the same thread can lock the same read-write lock multiple times uh, with read lock, uh, but you should remember to unlock it multiple times as well. It's not clear to me off the cuff uh, when is a scenario where you would want that, but it is worth noting. 
Uh, and then there is uh, the unlock function, which looks, again, just like the mutex one. You just unlock the thing that you want to unlock. Uh, and one of the uh, details about that that's noteworthy is you don't have to specify what kind of unlock you want to do because that's known. When you pass in the lock, we know, um, the system knows which kind of lock you have. It, it, analogous to um, when you open a file or you open a socket, both of those are closed with the close function call. Uh, once you have it, it's easy to figure out what it is and, uh, and how to clean it up. So, right. We don't have to uh, specify uh, what kind of unlock operation we're doing. As for whether readers or writers get priority, the specification says that this is implementation defined. Uh, and the specification says, as a goal, you know, living the dream here, for threads that are of equal priority, a writer takes precedence over a reader. So you can get you know, priority given to... Uh, priority given to your writers by more or less giving them higher uh, priority uh, as far as their threat attributes are uh, set but your system may vary and it might choose not to respect that so if you actually really truly needed the uh, behavior where it says yes writers always have priority over a reader then you might actually have to implement it yourself and you can't use this type that's no fun but life is hard that could happen so why would you uh, why would you want this well without the readers writers lock this is the uh, non writer priority with risk of starvation version of the readers writers locks code and i've given it uh, by not choosing the writer priority version and also not choosing to eliminate the starvation uh, as a possibility the best chance of uh, of winning the comparison it does not uh, and so uh, here we have our count for readers, we have a mutex, we have a semaphore, uh, our initialization function will set readers to zero, initialize the mutex, initialize the semaphore, uh, again with an initial value of one, uh, and the cleanup function does destroy on both of those things. The writer will then, uh, as in the simple code, wait for the room to be empty, write some data, post, room empty. Good. The reader uh, locks a mutex, increment the number of readers. If readers is one, wait on room empty uh, and unlock the mutex, uh, read data, uh, and then uh, lock the mutex again, decrement the number of readers. If readers is zero, post on room empty, uh, and then unlock the mutex. So, yeah, this is the uh, sad version where everything is hard and struggly, and uh, we don't like that because uh, this is a lot better. If we use the reader's writer's locks, then we have something that looks a lot simpler and cleaner. The initialization just calls reader's writer's lock init. We don't have to track individually the number of readers. We don't have to do any of that. Uh, and if you're a writer, you call write lock. If you are a reader, you call read lock. The end. Now, there's no uh, implied or any kind of real enforcement about what kind of lock you acquire. And you can, if you want, acquire a read lock and then still write data. Nothing would stop you from that. You know, the, the thread police don't arrest your thread if you do that. Um, obviously, you get the wrong answer if you do that. Uh, you uh, don't get the expected behavior because then you can't have concurrent writes. So you, know, you do have to still take responsibility to use this tool correctly. Um, but if you do, it really could save you quite a lot uh, of typing and save you from reinventing the wheel. With this behind us, we're going to move on to an extension of the reader's writer's problem called the search insert delete problem, obviously made by somebody who wasn't a fan of Metallica, otherwise they would have called it the seek and destroy problem. Uh, but there are three kinds of thread that we have now. We have searchers, we have inserters, and we have deleters. Okay, each of them has their own sort of definition. Searchers merely examine a linked list, and we'll say that we have a shared linked list of data, so you know, this is 
common and needs to be protected by some sort of concurrency control. Uh, that part is expected. Now, searchers are going to search and they will call search with a pointer to the target that they're searching for. Does it find anything? Maybe. Um, they resemble readers in the reader writers problem. They don't change anything. They just look. And they tell you if it's there or not. Inserters add new items to the end of the list. Only one insertion can take place at a time. However, uh, one insert can proceed in parallel with any number of searches. Uh, inserter threads call a function find insert location to find where to do the insertion. Uh, and then they call insert once they have uh, a location. So what you're going to insert and what the uh, after place is, you know, after this node insert this thing, uh, will happen. Inserters resemble readers, but there is kind of a restriction. And the restriction is that we can only be actually doing one insertion at a time, but insertion can happen in parallel with any number of searches. You might think that doesn't make any sense. You might think, well, I'm manipulating uh, the list with the insert, and so uh, how do I square that with the fact that readers are searching the list? So the thing is that when you're searching for some data in what is ultimately a shared data structure, there's no guarantee, even if you had total mutual exclusion, only one thread could even look at it at a time, uh, that what the order is going to be in which they happen. So if you had like total mutual exclusion, you know, regular mutex surrounding it, and you had you know one uh, thread that searches and one thread that inserts, and the search has to wait for the insert, well, then it won't find it. Uh, sorry, it will find it because you know, the insert has taken place. On the other hand, if it happened in the other order and the, the uh, search goes first but the insert hasn't happened yet, then it won't find it, and neither of those answers is wrong. All right. Uh, that you know, at the time when you do the search, you get the most up-to-date information, and that could change, and it could be invalidated basically instantly. But there's no requirement that an answer you get is valid forever, just it was valid at the time of the search. So having an insert that takes place in parallel with searches isn't bad, as long as the structure of the list is manipulated correctly, which is easy enough to do. We, we have some... Uh, some tools that allow us to do that. Uh, and if that is the case, then uh, a search will either find it or it won't. If we're lucky, we find it. If we're unlucky, we don't find it. Um, but it doesn't matter whether or not the insert really took place or not, because it will all work out in the end. Uh, and then we have deleters, and deleters remove items from within the list, uh, and deleters, you know, we can't actually uh, just have a rule saying deleters can run in parallel with anything. Uh, at most, one deleter process can access the list at a time, uh, and when it does so, nobody can be inserting and nobody can be searching. And deleter threads call delete with an avoid star uh, argument of whatever it is we are looking to delete, if anything at all is found. Okay. Good news is we don't have to modify our solutions dramatically if our goal is to make this work. We just have to sort of keep track of uh, a couple of things. One is when there are no inserters, and the other is when there are no searchers. Those kinds of things matter to deleters mostly, uh, and we need a mutex to go around the actual insertion, making sure that no two threads are trying to insert at the same instant. So let's go. Uh, we have a searcher mutex, we have an inserter mutex, we have a mutex that's going to be used around perform insert, uh, and we have a semaphore no searchers, we have a semaphore no inserters, and we have counts for each of those. As you might imagine, the searcher mutex is used to modify the integer searchers, the inserter mutex is used to modify inserters, uh, and perform insert is the mutex that has to be acquired before actually calling the insert function. So that part is okay. Uh, and then we have an initialization function, create uh, the, create the uh, mutex, create the semaphores, uh, initialize them set everything to zero uh, for the integers and initialize our uh, semaphores each to one. 
Okay, what does a searcher thread do? Well, a searcher thread, like I said, tremendously resembles a reader. Um, so, uh, lock the mutex, increment the count of searchers. If we're the first one, wait on no searchers, which indicates, of course, you know, we are the first one. So, lock it behind us. Or alternatively, if a deleter is doing something, wait for the deleter to be finished. Uh, and then unlock the mutex. Then we can search for the target. We can unlock the mutex. So, we can lock the mutex again, decrement searchers, uh, and then post. Uh, if we are the last searcher, uh, and then unlock again when we're done. So this is just reader code. Uh, it is more or less the same uh, as what we've already seen for the reader. It's just now called searcher, so you know, find and replace. No, uh, no challenge there. Uh, deleters are also pretty simple. Uh, so deleter is just this. Uh, wait for there to be no searchers and wait for there to be no inserters right now. Once that is the case, delete. Uh, and then we can post on no inserters and we can post on no searchers uh, when we leave. So in this case, the uh, deleter thread looks a lot like a writer. Um, and the writer is, uh, is just waiting for two kinds of threads, so searchers and inserters. Um, but nothing fancy happens there. Uh, no cause for concern. Uh, we might look at this and say, well, we have nested weights. Is, is that a problem? But we'll see when we uh, look at the inserter code that if there are inserters, much like readers, they will eventually finish and leave. Uh, could, could take a while, but you know, this is uh, a finite amount of time, so there's nothing to worry about, and uh, they will eventually depart, meaning that a deleter will get unblocked. Okay, and then the inserter thread looks a bit like the um, a bit like the reader, just with a couple of um, a couple of oddities to it. So, lock a mutex, increment the number of inserters if we're the first one, then wait on no inserters, which would either wait for a deleter to be finished or tell deleters that they have to wait. Uh, then unlock the mutex, uh, and then we'll find the insert location, uh, lock the mutex, perform the insertion, insert it wherever it's supposed to go, uh, and then unlock. Now, could there be a significant period of time between when we find the insert location and when we perform the insertion? Actually, yes, there could be. Uh, but if your list doesn't have to be sorted and find insert location just you know, looks for the end of the linked list, it will still appear in the list, and it doesn't matter if it's not sorted, so it doesn't matter if the element we're inserting is not the last one. That would be okay. Um, it might look a little strange, and it might make you feel uncomfortable because, like, here we are not doing things in order. Um, but this is acceptable. This would work. This is okay. Um, part of the reason why that works and why it's okay is that there can't be a deletion in the meantime. Uh, so searchers don't affect the list, so it doesn't matter how many searchers happen between uh, when we find the location when we actually do the insertion. So nothing to worry about them. Uh, other insertions could occur. If they do occur, as I said, it just means we're not necessarily inserting at the end of the linked list, but no harm done. Uh, again, as long as there's no requirement that the linked list somehow be sorted by anything, and that includes adding order. Um, and what about deletion? Well, there couldn't be a deletion in that period because uh, any deleter would be stopped by trying to wait on no inserters. If a deleter was already running, the first inserter would get blocked at the semwait statement uh, up here. If there uh, is a deleter that wants to run, but an inserter is already past this step, the deleter will be stuck. The deleter will wait until no inserters is true, and therefore no deletion could happen. And therefore the insert after will not be a node that has been deleted. That couldn't happen. Uh, and this is part of the trick as to you know, how it works. Now, uh, once we have actually successfully inserted the item into the list, unlock the mutex, uh, as you could imagine, um, we actually do have to make sure that inserts only happen one at a time. Uh, if we are updating the next pointer of, uh, the, of the given node, suppose two inserters choose the same insert location, uh, then one of them would win and one of the nodes would get lost. And for that reason, we can't have uh, two concurrent insertions. But 
Uh, as long as we respect that rule, we'll be okay. Uh, and then when we're done with that, we lock the inserter mutex. Uh, and we can decrement it, uh, our count of inserters. Uh, if we're the last one, then post indicating that there are no inserters, which would again allow a deleter to run if one is waiting. Uh, and then we will unlock and we're done. So, okay. The inserter, like I said, very much resembles a reader, just with this little extra bit in here where instead of just read, there's a little lock and insert and unlock, uh, which is kind of novel. Uh, otherwise, the deleter resembles a writer. It just has to wait for two kinds of other thread, and the searcher is pretty much exactly the same as a reader. So it's not that different of a variation, but it gives you an idea of how when you have different threads with specialized jobs, it might make sense to adapt your concurrency control to uh, allow those threads to perform their best under the circumstances. If we didn't do this, if we said, well, uh, you know, inserters are the same as writers, you know, deleters and inserters are both writers, uh, then you know, potentially that is going to slow things down because while well, an insert is going on, searches can't happen. Uh, and similarly, um, you know, we could only have one inserter doing any of it at a time. Maybe that's correct for your application. Um, it should be noted that there were a couple of assumptions that make the inserter logic work the way it's supposed to work. Uh, and one of those assumptions is it doesn't matter uh, in what order things are inserted in the list. Uh, all that matters is that they get there. That's not always a safe assumption. Frequently, you want your list to be sorted by something, uh, in which case you do actually need to enforce your ordering. Uh, and similarly, if you wanted to give priority to insertions or something over reads, then you would need to take some steps so that readers have to wait until a pending insertion is done to see to it that uh, everybody gets the most up-to-date version of things. Now, uh, in a previous term, uh, a student asked me this question, which is, could you implement this using the pthread readers writers lock type in spite of the fact that there are three different kinds of thread? Uh, obviously, you can only use read lock and write lock. There's no way to you know, implement your own inserter lock or deleters lock or anything. Um, fun as that might be. Um, but if you just think about it a little bit, is there a way to implement this search insert delete with readers writers lock? It is an interesting question and uh, we'll look over the uh, inserter and the deleter and the searcher just a little bit while you think about it. Okay, the first hint that I'll give is the answer is yes. It is possible to do this. And then the question is how? The second hint and the uh, final one that I, I will give on this topic uh, is to Keep in mind what these resemble. So a searcher resembles a reader, a uh, deleter resembles a writer, and an inserter also, to a certain extent, resembles a reader. So maybe it's possible to use that hint to figure out what to do. The actual solution to this uh, isn't shown in the slides, uh, and it doesn't appear in the notes either, so you will uh, have to design your own. But I don't think that should be too difficult. Um, when we uh, go back and look at the uh, comparison of the regular version uh, versus the uh, current version with uh, readers, writers, lock types, then I think it makes it pretty easy to figure out how to do this. Okay, 
So with that in mind, uh, we will leave off uh, for now here with, uh, with the end of this topic. Uh, the reader's writer's problem uh, is interesting and it's useful especially in certain high performance computing kind of situations where you're really trying to squeeze out every possible uh, bit of concurrency from your program. However, the uh, next uh, classical synchronization problem that we want to talk about, the dining philosophers one, uh, is probably the one we go into the most detail about because it finally introduces us to our formal discussion of deadlock. So we'll leave it here and uh, continue that in the next video.